Welcome to Africa Answers, a series featuring young African leaders unpacking topical issues affecting Africa and proposing solutions to those challenges. I'm your host, Sling Dilemblilo. I'll be speaking to Teniola Tayo from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. She is a policy advisor and specializes in investment, trade and development. Welcome, Teni. Thank you, Sling Dilo. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, Teni and I will be unpacking the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Tani works uh, in the space and it's, it's an area that she's very interested in. Tani, I think uh, just to get us into this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know what the African Free... Oh, this is a time <laughs> twister for me. It the is. The African <laughs> Continental Free yeah. Trade Agreement is all about. Can you please unpack this for us and, and what is it trying to achieve? Absolutely. So it's the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, the AFCFTA. Mm -hmm. It's a very clumsy acronym. I don't know why they designed it that way. Some people call it the AFTA, but that's not really um, its name. But then I'll call it the AFTA sometimes in this conversation, so I don't confuse too many yeah. people with the with the with the letters. It's really an agreement to liberalize tariffs, and what that means is to eliminate taxes on about ninety seven percent of the goods and services that are produced and traded within Africa. We exchange goods in Africa, and then we're seeing that when a good that has been produced in one African country is entering another African country, taxes should not be applied to that good, which means that that good can be more competitive than maybe a good that's coming from outside Africa, from China or from the EU or from the US, and it makes a good cheaper, and it means that we consume more made in Africa goods. But then the agreement is not only removing tariffs, they're also trying to remove non-tariff barriers to trade because when you look at African trade, it's not just the taxes that are blocking people from trading with each other. It's the fact that if you're trying to move something from Nigeria to Somali, you're going to face a lot of challenges. If you're trying to move it by air, it's going to be too expensive. By water, also too expensive and very few options. By road, you're going to face insecurity. It's going to be too long and also too expensive. So there are a couple of non-tariff barriers. You also have corruption at the borders and just you know a bunch of issues that the agreement is seeking to address. Um, in an effort to increase intra-African trade. Yeah. Why do we want to increase intra-African trade? <laughs> you know, we talk a lot about Ubuntu, you know, Africa, Pan-Africanism, but then it's not just about ideology, really. And I'll take it back a little bit. A lot of Af African countries were colonia colonialized. Colonized? A lot of African countries are colonized mm -hmm. and one of the objectives of the colonial project in many countries was to find new markets and in two ways. So to find new markets for the goods that were being produced by the growing industrial economy in those countries, so the, for the manufactured goods, but also to find supply markets for raw materials. So they wanted raw materials to come to places like the UK, maybe to Europe, and then they wanted a place where they could sell the things that they were producing. And it meant that a lot of those countries now took on the shape of what we call the colonial trade economy, where the trading structures were going from the country outside the country to usually the colonial entity that was um, running things in those countries. And since the end of colonial, colonial, colonization. colonization or colonialism, a lot of countries have struggled to really break out of that structure. And what you even have now is that even though the trading relationship between some countries and their former colonial governments have changed, you have uh, a partner like China, you know, playing that role where a lot of raw materials are leaving African countries to go to China. And then a lot of manufactured goods from China are going to African countries. But you now talk about what's happening within Africa and there's not much, you know. So, I mean, the movement of goods from one African country to the other because everyone is moving outwards. And why should we move, I mean, buy from ourselves? Because also the data shows that when Africans buy from themselves, there's a higher value goods involved. And what it just means is that while maybe Zambia may sell copper to the UK or to wherever, to China, or when Zambia is selling things to Malawi, it may be you know, clothes, right? So goods that have undergone some sort of transformation and not just raw materials. And why is this important? It's because of industrialization. I don't want to use a lot of technical terms, mm -hmm. but then industrialization is just the idea that, you know, we need to transform our economies to produce higher value goods mm -hmm. and not just raw materials. Because raw materials, when you produce raw materials and sell raw materials, you're a price taker. 
and that means that if you sell crude oil you know there's not many varieties of crude oil there are some varieties but not many so the prices of crude oil are often set by the market mm -hmm. but when you're producing something that is a bit more unique then you can set your price right and then that translates to more value for your producers in your country so we want to use intra-african trade to boost african industrialization and to boost incomes of africans because when there's more production on the continent it means that there are going to be more jobs and that's what we really need um, in Africa. We need millions and millions of jobs to be to be provided. So I'd say the AFCFTA is seeking to boost in traffic and trade. And I should clarify that it's just the latest effort to do that. We've tried to do that a couple of times. This is the latest effort um, to remove tariff barriers, but also non-tariff barriers to trade mm -hmm. and then to grow prosperity for Africans. And the final end goal is to put us in a better position for global trade. Yeah. Because now we're at the bottom of global trade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've said a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, it's really important uh, points, right? But uh, I, I just wanted to find out from you, where are we right now? Because we know that as of November, I think uh, yeah. 44 out of the 54 states that have signed, right, have ratified the protocol. So in terms of getting it to be actually implemented uh, and see the gains that we're trying yeah. to, to work towards, where are we currently? Um, so I'll talk about this um, in a couple of stages. So mm -hmm. there's the negotiations. The negotiations are happening in two phases. There's a phase one negotiations and the phase two negotiations. The phase one negotiations are almost complete. And under that, you have the protocol on trading goods and trading services, because it's not just goods you want to trade, it's also services. You have a few other protocols like investments or competition. There is one thing holding up the trading goods negotiations, which is the rules of origin. But I think I'll come back to that later. And for the the, second, the phase two negotiations, they're also ongoing. And there's an expectation that between next year to the year after, they'll be completed. And then you have the issue of trade facilitation. So the idea is that it's not just about the tariffs, right? If you remember, the AFCFT is not just about removing tariff barriers. It's also about removing non-tariff barriers. And when I say tariffs, you can think of them as taxes, mm -hmm. import taxes that are applied to goods coming from outside the country. So for the non-tariff barriers, you need trade facilitation to address them. And trade facilitation is just, you know, the way the, the, the words go is to facilitate trade. How do you help trade happen? So there's a secretariat for the AFCFT. It's based in Accra. And they're putting in some measures to try to help with trade facilitation. So one thing that they've done, for example, is to set up a mechanism for monitoring non-tariff barriers. So if, for example, a trader from Ghana is trying to export to Nigeria and he's asked for a bribe at the, at the customs, then he can report on that platform and say, the Nigerian customs did not let my products get in and they were asking for a bribe. Mm -hmm. And then when that is recorded, the secretariat is going to work with a few actors to reports that to the Nigerian government so that that is addressed. So a mechanism for monitoring that. There's also an Africa Trade Observatory, which is more or less trying to gather data to make sure that we can keep track of whether African trade is growing or not, you know, because we need data to really to inform policy. There's some other things like the Pan-African payment systems, because, you know, Africa is 54 countries or 55, depending on who you're asking. And we have many different currencies. There are a few currency unions in West Africa with the Cefa franc or and in Central Africa, but largely it's many different currencies. And how do you pay one person? Um, how do you pay from Nigeria to South Africa when you're dealing from Naira to Rand? Mm. So the Pan-African payment system, which is the PAPS or the PAPS, mm. will help that to happen. So you can pay a trader in South Africa in Naira and then they receive their funds in mm. Rand. So, I mean, there's also something called the Adjustments Fund. And it's really the question of how in Africa, even though we're all largely struggling with our development, um, some people are struggling more than others. So there's a categorization within the AFCFT in terms of some countries are called the LDCs, the least developed countries. And then you have the non-LDCs, so the non-least developed countries. And then you have the G6. Um, the G6 are technically um, lower than the LDCs because they're being given more time to remove tariffs mm. so that it doesn't affect them as much because, you know, taxes play a, a part in government, right? When you apply taxes to imports, it's because you want to raise revenue. And if you're saying that you're going to remove tariffs, it means it can affect the revenue that you generate as a government. Mm. So there's an adjustment fund that has been set up by the African Exports Imports Bank, Afrexim. It's $1 billion dollars. 
And this is going to help countries to cushion the effects of removing the tariffs on the goods that are coming in. So that's under trade facilitation. A lot is happening there. And then you have trade itself. So I think that's the more controversial part because last year, January, it was announced that the AFCFT had started. Um, but there's been no trade under the AFCFT yet, under the formal agreement. Mm -hmm. But what has happened now in October was that a pilot phase of the agreement was launched. It's called the Guided Trade Initiative, the GTI. And here the Secretariat is trying to help some countries, about eight countries, to trade with themselves as one way to test the agreement, mm -hmm. to test the systems that have been put in place and to figure out where we need to change and adjust things while we wait for negotiations to be finalized um, at the continental level. Yeah. So a lot is happening, a lot of structures are being shifted, you know, it's um, historic ties that are being reorganized. Yeah. So I'd say that we're making some progress in terms of trying to implement the AFCFTA. Yeah, so in terms of like uh, implementation, I know you mentioned that uh, the, 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 the trade agreement is not the first, it's not the first time yeah. Africa has tried to do something like this to promote intra Africa trade. Besides the Rex, what, 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 which I'll get to in, mm. in a moment, what are the lessons uh, that, um, you know, people who are working around the implementation of the, the, the agreement can learn from what has been tried to be done in the past, like what we've tried to do in the past but hasn't worked. So what are the lessons that we can borrow from that to make sure that uh, we don't duplicate the same mistakes? It's a very important question and it's a question that I think we all have to ask ourselves because there's this issue of political will. When you try to do something on a continental level or on a transnational level, you're working with many different actors and interests and you have to find a way to align these interests for everyone to move forward. So if the overall objective in some way clashes with the subcontinental interest, then things are not going to move forward. And in Africa or in the African Union, we've always faced ch this challenge where when the heads of states get together, it's very nice for them to be very supportive of things. You know, they're very happy to sign the charters. My country is one of those countries. We've signed many charters on human rights on the ECOWAS level, which is the West African um, regional community and on the African Union level, but we often don't uphold them. You know, so they sign when they get to Addis Ababa, where the African mm -hmm. Union is. But when they get back home, they're focused on their national interest. Mm -hmm. So when you have a clash between national interest and continental interest, things are not going to move forward, even when they say that they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. In ECOWAS as well, we've been trying to launch a single currency for 20 years now. For 20 years, we've been saying we're going to launch a single currency. Five times we announced a date and then we did not meet that date. Why hasn't that happened? Mm. It's not just for economic reasons, because there's no real interest in launching that currency. But everyone comes to meetings and to summit and we say, oh, it's going to be a good thing. We're going to do it very soon. Mm. But it's not going to happen because nobody really wants it. So the issue of political will is very important. And with the AFCFT, generally there is a perception that it's uh, it's enjoyed a lot of political will because of the speed of signing. I mean, 54 out of 55 countries have signed and 44 of those 54 have ratified. It's the fastest um, process that has ever happened as far as AU instruments go. But, you know, then the devil is in the details because you sign and then you have to implement. And implementing means that you're opening your borders to goods from Africa, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people are thinking about it as they're going to be selling to Africa, mm. but not many many people have accepted that it also means that they have to buy from Africa. Everyone wants to export um, and everyone is trying to protect their markets. Mm. So I think the one thing that we need to learn from other arrangements, other arguments is that if this is going to happen, mm. then we need to make sure that the national interests are aligned with the continental interests. Try to find, you know, points of neutrality where we can make sure that's okay. A head of state, a president, a leader is not going to feel like him sticking to the letter of the agreement is mm. going to upset the political settlements in his country, like maybe the manufacturers' associations or the farmers' associations, and just manage the communication and the messaging where it's clear that there are going to be trade-offs, right? Free trade often creates winners and losers in theory. But then this awareness that overall, at the end of the day, we are all going to win, you know, even though there'll be some permutations along the line, we're mm -hmm. all going to win. So I think that that's very important, the messaging and also the political will to sustain it in reality by aligning national interest and the continental aspirations. Yeah. So now in terms of like on a way forward, right? Um, I mean, I mentioned the Rex earlier. We know that there's already 
you know, regional yeah, um, trading, right? For example, we have SACO in Southern Africa, right? I think there's Comesa as well. Yeah. So, like, those are things that have been happening. Mm -hmm. What What are the some of the things that the the can be learned mm. from what's already been in place, right? That we can we can borrow and uh, implement uh, in the overall agreement, number yeah. one. And also, besides that, what other um, suggestions would you have in terms of uh, ensuring that um, we are really, like you're saying, we're yeah. lacking implementa implementation, right? Yeah. We're really implementing and pushing towards the goal of uh, getting to Africa trading with each other. Yeah. For the RECs, it's a mixed bag because mm. you have some RECs. The RECs are the regional economic communities mm. that have been more successful than others in terms of trade. So you have some RECs that it's even possible that after they launched their own free trade agreements, trade declined, you know. Because like I said, when leaders commit to the letter of, of a document sometimes, they don't do the same with implementation. And even sometimes, after committing to the letter of an agreement, they even make sure that they put in barriers that would block implementation because they don't actually want it. Mm. So that's one thing to learn. And I think that the AFCFT is already trying to learn that because this AFCFT is not just about removing taxes. It's also about addressing the barriers that are not related to taxes. That is embedded in the agreement itself mm. because we've realize that um, those ones often eventually block trade. So I think mm -hmm. that's a big um, burning point. The other thing that we're trying to learn from the RECs is dispute settlements because of when you trade, you're going to have disputes, you know. Uh, we've had some disputes in East Africa where I think was it between Uganda and Kenya where someone was selling milk to the other person and someone was saying that no your milk is not coming from your country you're importing the milk and repackaging it for us so you need to be able to have a platform for settling disputes and have a mechanism for that luckily the RECs have some experience with that a bit of experience with it right so the AFCFT will also be learning from the RECs experience. And, you know, the RECs are closer to the countries and to the people, technically. Mm. The African Union is in Addis, the AFCFT is in, the Secretariat is in Accra. Mm -hmm. But then it's the RECs that are really, I mean, the ECOWAS commissions, the SACUs and because they're closer to the mm. countries and they have been working with them for a number of years now. So when you're trying to settle disputes or settle issues, they even have more um, interaction or more of a connection with the countries and with the local the national trade structures as far as the public officials go so they'll also be playing a big part um, in the AFCFT. I should mention that's also core to the AFCFT is that the RECs are a building block for the AFCFT. The AFCFTA again with the, <laughs> with the awkward acronym is not going to replace the RECs in fact it is going to be relying on the RECs for its implementation so it would only come into force where trade within the RECs or where the provisions within the RECs do not apply. So ECOWAS or the West African countries have ECOWAS and they already have those ar arrangements for trading amongst themselves. They may not need the AFCFT, but they'll need the AFCFT when they're, they're trying to trade with um, East African countries. So you see, that's where the AFCFT mm. uh, comes mm. in. It's more like a, an intra interrec uh, trading mm -hmm. um, arrangement. So the AFCFT is relying on the RECs um, for many things, for knowledge, also for dispute settlements, and also just for their, the fact that they're more in touch with the, with the national government. Yeah. And then uh, besides that, what other ideas would you have in terms of contributing to its success? That you think we should be thinking about? Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's a tricky one, but it's about more coordination, mm -hmm. you know. You know, when you talk about transnational issues, really, and it's about having a problem that is beyond the individual or beyond the nation states and it affects the collective and trying to decide that you also should try to address the problem as a collective. But it's not easy because you have interests, again, at the national level. So I think we need to coordinate a little bit more, not just the trade policy as we're doing, but also production policies. You know, because for you to trade, you have to produce. <laughs> and at the moment, we're not producing very much mm. on the African continent. Mm. So you can have a situation where this agreement is being implemented, but because no one is really producing much, then we're still importing from outside the continent because the agreement is not blocking imports from outside mm. Africa, actually. Yeah. Um, it's just trying to encourage trading within Africa. So we need to coordinate production. Why? Because if we're all producing the same thing, then we're going to be competing for very small markets. In West Africa, for example, 
we know Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire as cocoa producers, but people don't know that countries like Cameroon, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon is in is in Central Africa, but then Nigeria are also trying to produce cocoa. And if you have everyone trying to produce cocoa, you have everyone trying to produce cement, then can you see that the market becomes small? But then if one person is producing cocoa, one person is producing cement, or let's even break it down, we don't want to sell raw materials. One person is producing chocolate, but then in the chocolate value chain, you have you need cocoa paste, you need you know to process the cocoa pods. So maybe Ghana is producing the chocolate, maybe Cote d'Ivoire is producing the cocoa pods, maybe Togo is refining the cocoa paste. You know, so that makes it complementary, and it means that rather than competing with ourselves for markets, our production systems are working with each other, so the gains are being distributed. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, along the different countries. Yeah. It's also important because, again, we have different capacities um, in Africa. South Africa is uh, the most industrialized country on the continent, so they have more capacity to produce things like even cars. You go to Morocco, so they can produce cars. Some countries like Nigeria are trying to assemble cars, but we have some countries that can't even touch car production yet at the moment, right? We have different capacities, but it doesn't mean that some people should be left out, you know? We have to meet each other where we are. Mm. So it's a question of what can Gambia do? Gambia is a small country in West Africa, a very tiny country. What can Gambia do and how can we embed this in the value chain in West Africa? So that when we're trading in West Africa, the gains are not only going to Ghana, to Cote d'Ivoire, to Nigeria, but Gambian producers are benefiting from mm. it. This is so important because that's the only way to sustain mm. the support for the agreement. Mm. If this agreement leads to a loss of jobs, you know, from some countries because they feel like, you know, they're not benefiting much, they're just receiving a lot of imports from Africa, you know what's going to happen, you know? You have one politician that will wake up somewhere and then their campaign message is going to be that the AFCFTA is not working for us. Um, but, you know, it's happening everywhere else in the world. So we need to learn, you know, from these things and make sure that we're carrying everyone along. So coordinating production policies and it's linked to coordinating investment promotion policies. Mm. Luckily, we just um, finished the negotiations for the investment uh, protocol, but that's about intra-African investments. But we also need to attract foreign investment. So it's about local investments and foreign investment. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't all be struggling for the same investors. It's mm -hmm. not gonna. It's not gonna work, you know. So instead of competing in, in that way, let's coordinate. So let's say, like we, we use the question of chocolate. If everyone is trying to attract foreign investors to come and mm. establish chocolate manufacturing in their countries, we are competing for a small market. But if Ghana is focusing on finding an investor that can do the finished chocolate thing, another country, Cote d'Ivoire, is trying to find an investor that can help with the cocoa paste. Another one is trying to find an investor that can help with the cocoa pods. You know, then it's complementary. It's more specific. It's more realistic. It's more mm. achievable. Mm. So I'd say more coordination is needed. Um, even though at the end of the day, the sovereignty of African countries is, is quite important to them, thanks to our history. Yeah. 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 And what about external partners? Do you see them playing a role in, in helping to support uh, the protocol? Absolutely. You know, the agreements. The and agreement because, is, yeah. yes, um, we're not the only free trade area in mm. the world. You know, a lot of people have experience with this. Where, I mean, the European Union, you have the common markets there. It's one of the most successful examples of this, and they have a lot of experience with it. So I think that external partners can help in a couple of ways. First of all, there's the knowledge sharing. But the knowledge sharing, you know, in a more nuanced way, because as much as we want to learn from others, we also want to be able to do things um, in our own way. Mm -hmm. But to do that, you need to understand how others have gone about it, so what have been their successes, mm -hmm. what have been their challenges, what have been their failures, and then think about how to implement that as you go um, with your own. So for example, um, I, mean, I mean, this issue of late development or late industrialization, you can learn from the mistakes of others and make sure the ideas a bit better. Mm -hmm. So we need knowledge, we need capacity building, but in a sustainable way because at the moment what a lot of external partners do is that they fund maybe projects short-term projects that have consultants maybe people like me or or people from outside Africa that come and support um, an AFCFT institution or something like that but that's often not sustainable because when the project ends those consultants leave and all of their knowledge all of their expertise goes with them mm -hmm. so I think something that's a bit more sustainable where it's more of an institutional support 
So you have, um, for example, customs officials from the European side of things, if you talk about the EU, and then you have customs officials from the African side of things. Can we have some a more long lasting partnership where the, there's a constant exchange of information? Or how do you normally handle this? We're seeing something like this. Have you seen it before? How did it work for you? And then we decide how we want it to work for us. So that's on knowledge and capacity building. Then the other thing is finance and investment very important you know like i said we need to scale up our production and we need capital for that coming from within africa but also from mm -hmm. outside africa so we need external partners to encourage the investors um to come and invest in africa we now have a single market of 1.2 billion people so the investment case is solid and uh in the eu there's a global gateway initiative i think it's an interesting one 150 billion dollars of the initiative has been allocated to africa or that's the 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 plan until 2027 and there's now an opportunity to try to align the global gateway objectives and the afcfts objectives mm. so in terms of infrastructure investment can it be in such a way that even though the global gateway is supposed to be building roads to mm. europe but then is it possible that it can also build roads within africa and help with mm -hmm. infrastructure financing in that way i think there's some efforts around that already um i, I saw that they were in Miami, i think last week for the industrialization week and there were some discussions around that but we need more finance you know trade finance but also more investment in production capacity and infrastructure and logistics um on the continent um that can come from from external yeah and then on the ground locally how can people like myself uh what role can we play and what, what space is there for your individuals? Because I think it, it also affects your normal African citizens yeah, on the does, ground, right? Yeah. And sometimes when you talk about policies and protocols yeah. and uh, agreements that are made at a higher level, we sometimes forget the influence that your grassroots organizations or your normal yeah. citizens can mm -hmm. play. Is there space <laughs> for us there? <laughs> How yeah. do we also create awareness so that mm -hmm. people get to know about this and actually start pushing their governments to, you know, buy-in into this uh, so that we can start seeing more movement in this mm. area? It's very important, you know. So it's a question of public support for the agreement. And I think that we need to do a bit more because at the moment, I wouldn't say that the average African knows about the AFCFTA or even if they knew about it, even just the name itself is confusing. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, yeah. It's a time to step for me. <laughs> what is that? And if they wanted to ask someone, oh, I heard about the AA, you know, so there's a problem there. But I think that, um, yes, we need to find a way to communicate this to every single African. And depending on what role you play in your country, like you're a researcher, so it's about increasing knowledge production on the AFCFTA, yeah. on the challenges that you might face and how to mitigate those challenges challenges mm. if maybe a producer it's about finding out how you can make sure that your goods can participate in trading under the afcfta maybe you make african dresses right but then maybe you've been importing your african fabric from china which is what's often happened but for you to you know qualify for trade under the afcfta you may need to import that fabric from africa so you need to find um, a market in africa maybe from ghana which has some textile production from togo you know, so you need to, you know, figure out how to also help with this mm. um, objective of industrialization and buying mm. from Africa. Yeah. But for the African public in general, I think that's, you know, I'd say it's good to be engaged, to go read more about the AFCFT. Mm. And I'm someone that is very realistic. I don't think everyone should go read research papers or policy papers, but mm. go on YouTube. If you go on YouTube, you search African Free Trade Agreements, you'll see a lot of information, easy to consume, a number of documentaries. If you listen to podcasts, there's been a lot of discussions about it as well. It's good to know what's happening and to figure out where you fit in. You may be in finance, in banking, or just whatever. Even if you're an engineer mm -hmm. or a lawyer, you know, there's a space for you in there. Find out what your country is doing about the AFCFT, how the implementation is going there, and just get involved, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, on the African side, or on the side of the the bureaucracy or the sectarians, I think that it's very important to carry everyone along um, because at the end of the day, you know, the secretariat was not, well, it would, I mean, the head of secretariat was elected, but I mean that the Africans vote for their president. Mm. So 
they are the ones that have political power, you know, to get their presidents to do or their leaders to do one thing or the other. Mm. And if they do not support the agreement um, over time, then they would use that as one of the things that they use to evaluate their president or they'll use that as political pressure on their president. But if they support the agreement, then they would also use that, you know, as political pressure on their presidents to say things like, we need you to move forward on this because we support it, because mm. we're interested in it, because we know that it's in our benefit. Mm -hmm. So carrying every single person along is very important and i think that there's a lot a lot of efforts um going on towards this whether it can be it can be improved as yeah. well yeah. yeah so now when was i mean we, I, like from from the context that you're given you know some yeah. of the information that you're providing uh it's clear that this is going to be a great thing if it's very if it's yeah. executed and implemented yeah. well right yeah. and it has buy-in from mm. both the local and also you know at yeah. national our leaders right but in terms of uh because with everything, there's always like a, a risk as mm. well, right? Mm. So are there any potential challenges or, you know, any problems that can be created? Mm. But it will, either by the agreement itself or in the process of implementing the agreement, are there any blinders that people should be aware of mm. uh, or look into to ensure that as we are, implementing yeah. or working towards the implementation we are also addressing some potential risks or challenges that may be presented yeah so um when you go back to the theory of free trade areas it's very controversial because free trade creates um inequalities like i mentioned before it creates winners and losers sometimes you know like because there are some people that are better positioned to take advantage of free trade and then those that are not they lose out even go to uh, i mean a partnership trading partnership like the us and mm -hmm. china mm -hmm. the us being open to chinese imports actually led to import exposure in some american states and a lot of americans lost their jobs in some some states and some areas and some you know, scholars argue that that was part of what even led to eventually a Trump presidency because of that disenfranchisement. So you have to be very careful with trade sometimes, you know. And I think that with the AFCFTA, like I said, the countries are on different levels to an extent. But even within countries, you have divides or you have uneven developments. So in my country, there's a divide between the North and the South. The North is a bit, um, is trying to catch up you know, as far as developmentally compared to the South. So when you have a free trade area and you have production, there's a high chance that it's a lot of Southern cities that will be embedded in those trade and value chains because they're better able to do so. And then the Northern cities will now be left behind. You don't want that, you know, as a country because it leads to things like conflict and even to increased crime. Also inequalities between firms, because we have the large firms, we don't have many large firms in Africa. Um, we have a lot of SMEs or MSMEs and micro, small and medium businesses. But a lot of them can't afford to trade across borders in formal ways because the cost of trade are too high. And what it means is that a free trade area can benefit the large firms more and then they enjoy the benefits of trade. You have Dangote, for example, mm -hmm. even already exporting his cement across Africa, but the smaller guys are not able to do the same. So if you're not careful, trade or free trade can increase inequalities um, in many different ways in Africa. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to make sure that rather than mm -hmm. just sitting back and seeing that happen and then trying to not mitigate it after it happens, mm -hmm. we design this in such a way that we prevent this from happening. So the trade, um, the protocols now include a protocol on women and youth in trade. It was a new addition and it was from this discussion about inclusivity. How do you make sure that women-owned businesses or youth-owned businesses can trade under the AFCFT? So that's a new thing. They've included that. And it's part of us trying to do things um, mm -hmm. a little bit better. Yeah. But also it's about being more intentional about the idea of value chains. And value chains just means that even if Ghana is the exporting country for cook or chocolates in Africa, that production of chocolate is being done across a couple of different countries. Mm. So everyone is benefiting from it mm. one way or the other. So the gains are not only going to Ghana, but going to Cote d'Ivoire, to Togo, and to others. So the value chains are very important, the regional value chains. Mm. So the inequality issue is what to watch out for because inequality can lead to populist movements, you know, like we know. It can lead to mobilizing support against the agreement, support against even things like um, free movements because... The agreement is supposed to be implemented alongside the free movement protocol, although that is experiencing some delays. So inequality is a problem and the solution is to be intentional about trying to address that and not just have it as a side, yeah. as a side issue.
Yeah, definitely. Uh, another problem that we, we've spoken about at length, especially in class, and it comes up, is the challenge between traveling in yeah. Africa, right? How it's, you know, it's actually easier. Some even say it's easier to travel to Europe yeah. than to travel from within Africa, right? Yeah. Obviously, issues of trade include mm. transportation, mm -hmm. right? What, what's your reflection on this? Uh, this is something I can say a lot about. <laughs> because um, last year, I tried to travel to Cape Verde, uh, and it's in West Africa. I have an ECOWAS passport, which is a West African passport, but I wasn't allowed to enter Cape Verde. Um, and I traveled with my American friend. She was allowed to enter Cape Verde <laughs> based on her American passport. But then it just goes to this issue because free movement in Africa is very political, you know. So even when there's already a treaty, like in ECOWAS, allowing for free movement, countries still find ways to resist this because there's a preference. You see, it's easier to move outside Africa, but also African countries are sometimes more welcoming to people coming from outside Africa than to people coming from within Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's a big challenge, but I think that, I mean, one of the things that the agreement like the AFCFTA can do is to start getting us to think about these things, because if you have a trading relationship with someone, you become a little bit more open to even other kinds of exchanges, you know, you, it's like an introduction to a market or to a society monetarily you know in, in the sense that you're getting some value from it and then you become more open to the culture to the people you know i mean if you have business interest in malawi mm. um because you export to malawi then you want to know more about malawi right you want to visit malawi you want malawians to come mm. to your country so mm. i think that this agreement can in some ways even help mm. with um I'll say the shifts that we need, you know, the orientation shifts that we need in Africa to be more open to African travelers. It's not just people outside Africa that should be visiting Africa or traveling within Africa. Mm. It shouldn't be easier for um, for a Spanish woman to settle in Senegal than it is mm. for a South African woman to settle in Senegal because that's the current reality. Mm. So, yeah, you know, it's a very controversial issue. There's a protocol that is trying to encourage free movements. It's seen very um, few ratifications at the mm. moment. No one is interested in it. But perhaps if we get more Africans talking about it, you know, get yeah. them more interested in their continents, then we can move forward with that as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in addition to free movement, right, uh, another issue is the expensiveness of traveling, transportation yeah, costs, right? Yeah. It's ridiculously yeah. expensive to travel. Mm -hmm. um, how do we address that? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> if there's even a solution. <laughs> First, there's some efforts. So yeah. there's something called the Single African Air Transport Market, SA, S A A T M. I don't even know how they pronounce mm. how they pronounce that one. But then the idea is that they're trying to also remove tariffs on air tra air travel within Africa. Because the reason why it's so expensive sometimes it's not even just the cost from the airline, but the taxes that they have to pay at the airport, mm. it's quite high. Mm. So there's some efforts there. I don't know how much progress they've made because honestly, I think that they should have been moving fast on that because we need it for the AFCFTA. But hopefully that, um, that pans out. We also need more suppliers because you know you know the issue of demand and supply. When there's little supply, then prices are high. So there's not enough operators servicing travel within Africa there are more operators servicing travel out of Africa. So if you're trying to go from Nigeria to Malawi, maybe, I mean, I don't even know what that route is going to look like, you know, mm. at the moment. But some people are coming up. You have Ethiopian Airways, you have Askai, and, you know, a few others that are trying to connect Africa. So perhaps you need more investment in airlines or travel operators that are servicing the intra-African market. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you have Ryanair and EasyJet and, you know, Vueling here that, you know, facilitates intra-Europe travel mm. in a very cheap way, we need... Those, you know, many things like that in Africa. I don't even know if they will need to be subsidized that initially because um, air travel can be, um, I mean, airlines or the airline business can be quite expensive. Yeah. You have road travel as well. I did road from Nigeria to Senegal, passing through a couple of countries, but you have the issue of insecurity. So obviously we need to do some work about that. We also need more operators connecting African countries by road. Mm -hmm. We need more investments in infrastructure like trains, um, because trains will be faster than taking a, a, a bus, right, or, or a car um, by road. So we need more trans-African infrastructure. And there is a plan called the Trans-African Highways. Uh, they're trying to build sort of like corridors or transport corridors from Lagos to Abidjan and, you know, those kinds of arrangements to just make sure that we have more mm -hmm. connecting roads, more connecting um, infrastructure, more connecting yeah. airlines. You have the sea travel, also the issue that we have 
very few operators there. We also have the issue of insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea with piracy. Yeah. So it's a bunch of issues. There's the cost, is the security, but also the supply. We yeah. need to increase supply. Yeah. But are you seeing, just from your work, are you seeing concerted efforts in moving towards also addressing these issues in tandem with uh, getting the the free trade agreement to be implemented, right? Mm. For example, um, I was speaking to your colleagues who work in the space of climate change, yeah. uh, green transition and all those, is it energy transition, yeah. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I was asking them is that, is they, do they see a connection uh, to the work that they're doing? With what's currently happening with the, with the agreement, right? Um, at a high level, are you seeing these discussions starting to take place? That as we are preparing to have this intertrade among African countries, are we going to be looking at issues of climate change, right? Mm. You also brought up the free movement of persons protocol, right? How are we going to be ensuring that people are moving? Uh, you know, there's effective move or there's yeah. ease of movement, right? Um, are we seeing these discussions taking place? I mean, you did mention some yeah. efforts, right, that are here, that ongoing, are happening, yeah. Yeah, that are ongoing. Yeah. But in other areas, yeah. are there any other spaces that we should be looking into, that we should be bringing into mm. this discussion? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing about um, climate change is that you don't even have a choice now. <laughs> because even if you don't want to work on climate change, uh, let's say as an AFCFT secretariat, a lot of the funding that you might receive from external partners will be tied to climate change considerations. But that being said, sustainability is in everyone's interest and i mean we know that more than anyone else in, in in africa and i think that it's just about building a house we are now starting to build a house we have the opportunity to make the foundation sustainable and why shouldn't we take that opportunity why should we wait for 10 years or 20 years down the line to have to take down the house and rebuild it which is what a lot of other countries um in the global north are finding themselves doing now they need to like take down things that they already put in place long ago and try to make them more sustainable. So we have the opportunity to start with sustainability. So we're going to try to do that. I think that there's been a lot of knowledge production on the issue of sustainability and trade. It's going to be a difficult one because trade in its essence is very carbon intensive. We're talking about moving things across borders. You know, you have some countries outside that are rather even trying to keep things within the countries so in italy they say made in italy because you have less emissions if you're not trying to transport whatever it is from mm. outside italy to inside italy yeah. but um it's really about how do you find the balance right and i think that there's some efforts to also ask for african countries to be given more space in terms of more carbon space <laughs> because industrialization also in its sense is often carbon intensive but there's a discussion about green industrialization can we industrialize in a way that doesn't um, emit as much pollution or carbon emissions like the others did it feels a little bit unfair but at the end of the day it's in everyone's best interest especially for african countries you don't want to put more pollution in your environment um in nigeria we use um, fuel generators and the quality of the air is so bad so if someone is saying oh you need to be sustainable i mean the fact that we're not sustainable is affecting nigerians every day even in terms of their health so mm -hmm. it's in everyone's best interest to be sustainable mm -hmm. so i do see a lot of those conversations i see some of those efforts um, when it comes to implementation again i think it's going to be about finance because you know trying to make things sustainable sometimes comes at a cost at the beginning even though eventually it evens out. Mm. So it's to see more, you know, climate finance, you know, like we said, in the aspects of trade mm. um, and just tying everything uh, together. So there's lots happening, right? There's a lot yeah. of discussions, a lot of conversations. Yeah. Um, we just need to keep going. We need to put more action towards and we need to also put our money where our mouth, <laughs> our mouth are. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, after all is said and done, yeah. <laughs> what is your hope? For the agreement, I won't say the the the, the acronym because it's a tongue twister <laughs> for me. And I, but what is your hope as somebody yeah. who's working in the space and very passionate about yeah. uh, its advancement? What yeah. is what really is your hope, and where do you where do you see it taking Africa, or what is your hope for it yeah. in terms of driving uh, the continent uh, to where we want Africa to be? Yeah. So yes, a lot of people say that I'm passionate about the agreements. Mm. But what I'm passionate about is African development. Mm. And I've always been passionate about African development um, because I am African. <laughs> mm. And a lot of the things that are often associated with Africa, I 
I felt like I didn't identify with that and I wanted to make the African identity an identity to be proud of. So I thought, okay, let me contribute my own efforts to African development because, you know, many different drops make up the ocean. So I see the AFCFTA as our next chance for African development using trade. And it makes sense. I mean, even if you forget about the agreement, it makes sense. Why shouldn't I buy from you in Botswana, mm -hmm. you know, from Nigeria? Why should I, you know, buy from somewhere? Why not start with people that Simple are in home. my country? Yeah. Yes, it mm. makes sense because we're a little bit even closer and it's just, why not, right? So I am passionate about the agreement because of the potential it holds for African development, because of the potential it holds for African prosperity, so African jobs. We need, in Nigeria alone, we need 5 million jobs to be created per annum. Where are those jobs going to come from, you know? But then if we get producing, produce, 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 because mm -hmm. we need to trade, then there's going to be more money in people's pockets. They're going to afford a better standards of living. There'll be money in the pockets of Africans, but also in the pockets of African governments. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I say that, some people will say, hey, this African government, <laughs> not to steal our money, corruption. but then, yeah, no, corruption is a problem. Yeah. But they also need those mm -hmm. ones for public infrastructure, for public services, like mm -hmm. education and healthcare. Education is so important, you know, to give everyone a chance at a good life. Education is a leveler and healthcare, obviously, um, is super important as well. So those are my hopes, right? So if this agreement is implemented, um, if we pay enough attention to the risks, to the challenges, if we make sure that everyone is getting carried along, that in 10 years time, I mean, the African Union has an agenda 2063, I don't know how old I'm going to be at that time. So I hope things are going to get better <laughs> before then. But then in 10 years time, my neighbor looks a bit different in terms of the kind of life that um, she and her family are able to live. In yeah. 10 years time, I'm not seeing street children, you know, begging for food because, you know, their families are earning, they are producing, you know, they have incomes, they have healthcare, they have um, education. So those are my hopes really for this agreement that we start to produce, we start to trade and we start to grow our incomes on the continent. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Terry. This has been Thank great. Yeah. Before we wrap up, though, mm -hmm. you've been in Europe for three months. Yes. You've been in beautiful Florence, mm -hmm. learning a lot, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. I think one of the things that brought us here is learning this relationship between Europe and Africa, yeah. right? Um, from your time here, yeah. maybe, what are the lessons, reflections, uh, you know, that you want to, that you take away with you from, 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 from your time uh, engaging with the professors, with the different pr practitioners, policymakers uh, within the European context. What are the things that you will take with you that maybe you will use when you get back home, or that have actually even broadened up your broadened up your pers perspective yeah. on things? Yeah, I'd say that um, development and nation building and society building is a continuous effort. You know, in Nigeria, there's this thing that we say when we're referring to Western countries, we call them Sena climbs. Um, okay. Yeah. So, you know, saying like Sena climbs. So we say, okay. oh, in Sena climbs, they don't do this this way or they don't do this that way. And then I'm learning that, well, in Sena climbs, you know, they're also still struggling <laughs> with some things. It's, it's an ongoing, you, you, don't, you never finish, you know, as far as democracy um, so, so, so social cohesiveness goes and as far as development goes right it never ends sometimes you make some advancements and then you realize that parts of your population were not being carried along and then you have to go back to the drawing board like it's happening in, in parts of the UK where some of their regions are not catching up with the other parts of, 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 of the UK. So I think I'm learning that and I'm learning about this constant commitment to improvement which is what's I see from the European Union, from the Commission, this constant effort to improve things. I really admire the commitment to sustainability that I'm seeing from the EU side of things. And I think that they're putting their money where their mouth is or their mouth are. So you have the due diligence proposal, even though, you know, um, there are some issues with implementation or it hasn't been passed yet. You have a lot of different instruments that are trying to actually make sure that sustainability is not just not a buzzword, it's actually something that is guiding the behavior of people. At the mm -hmm. EUI, we received an email yesterday or today saying, you know, <laughs> if we yeah, put... Yeah, yeah, energy. <laughs> exactly, if we turn the lights off, it's going to reduce emissions and things. Like that. And I love that. It's really action and not just words. So I love that commitment. So I think I've learned that... Um, 
things never stop like whatever effort you're trying to do so we say african development we're not going to get somewhere in the future and then africa is developed and then that's it we're done we're going to have to keep on improving because development now looks different development now includes sustainability both environmental sustainability and social sustainability and then we need to keep on working hard i also admire the cooperation at the eu side of things it's not easy you know also working with i think 27 countries in the european union and then trying to combine their interests and working with all of them now there's a team europe initiative that i also find interesting and i know that they're also facing some challenges with it but i think we have a lot to learn from 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 that like how do you aggregate interest and make sure that everyone is moving towards um the collective goal uh, i mean for for a long time now as has been happening so that has been fascinating and i think i loved my fellow fellows like i call them <laughs> the fellow fellows in the yeah. cohort i learned a lot from them as well i learned a lot from all of the sessions mm-hmm. that we had and it's been a fantastic experience yeah awesome yeah thank you so much jenny thank, thank you. you for your time thank you for your insights I wish you the best. Thank uh, you. I have no doubt that I will <laughs> we'll get to read about the great things that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Same. It's been a pleasure. Same.